welcome back. I'm going to start by reviewing what we covered in the last uh, class, and then we're going to pick it up from there, talking some more about uh, new Python constructs. So the first thing we learned is the command print. The command print is a built-in Python program, and it has the following functionality. You pass it something, in our case it was just text embedded inside of quotes, and it will print that out to the console or the output window. In your case with Jupyter Notebooks, there is a cell where you type the code. When you run it, there's a cell underneath it. That's where the text output will be. Okay. So that's that command right there and that command right there. And of course, that command right there. So print, again, the, the syntax is print. That's the keyword, open paren, close paren, not square brackets, not curly brackets, not angle brackets, but round brackets. And then inside, if it's text, and we will see other types of uh, variables that you, uh, other types of things that you can print in a little bit, but if it's text, then it's inside of a double quote, okay? And then that will have the functionality of just printing something to the output. Now, in addition to the built-in functions that you have with Python, you can define your own functions, and that's what we are doing both here and here with, say, introduction and threatened vengeance. So remember, again, the syntax for defining, not running, but defining a function. You have the keyword def, you have the name of your function, and then you have an open paren, a closed paren, and a colon. Not immediately obvious why you have the parens yet. Wait a few lectures and we'll talk about sometimes we put things inside of that. So after that definition, name, paren, open, closed paren, and colon, comes an indentation and then the body of the function. Command, 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 whatever you want that to be. Built-in functions for Python, your own function calls, things that you imported, I don't care. When you call that function, it will evaluate the body and then return to where you called. So I've defined two functions here. You can see the two defs. One has one line of code in it. One has two lines of code. Here's a, a, a simple print statement. So when I evaluate this, all this code, the only thing that happens is it prints hello. And the reason, of course, is all I've done is define a function. I haven't called it. If I want to call it, I have to say introduction paren paren, and it will call the function threaten vengeance, then that, that text, followed by open paren, close paren, and then it will call the function. The programmer will skip up to here, and it will evaluate, evaluate the body, anything that's indented, and then return back below. Okay, so in addition to being able to define functions in line as you're typing your code, you can bring functions in from the outside, functions that are typed in, entered in into a different file. So here we did from simple functions, that's a file, import a function, print date and time. So again, notice the syntax here. The keyword from, the name of a file that has to be visible to the current code, so it has to be in the same directory. The keyword import, and then the name of a function. Notice something important here, please. Print date and time does not have parens. When we define a function, we define it with parentheses. When we call a function, we call it with parentheses because that tells the Python interpreter that you're either defining or calling a function. Here, we are doing neither. We are neither defining it nor are we calling it. We are simply saying that this bit of code has access to that function, so there's no parentheses there. Just some syntax, okay? So then I get to call that function, print date and time, and there you do see the parentheses because now I'm making a function call. At that point, it will go into the file simple functions, find where it says def print date and time, and then execute the body of the code. And of course, it prints as promised the date and the time by tapping into a system clock. We also started doing a little bit of drawing because you're going to use those for your first few assignments. So in addition to built-in commands, in addition to being able to define your own commands, in addition to being able to import your own functions, you can also import entire libraries or modules. So I had you install draw SVG, and then remember again the syntax. Import, please bring in the name, not of a file now, but of a module or, um, called draw SVG, which was imported, as draw. So that as draw is optional. It says I want to give a synonym to that word right there. And the only reason I do this is because this is a little bit shorter and I don't have to fuss around with the name of it with the capital S, which I always forget how to do. So what that means is every command in that module I now have access to by typing draw dot and then some other commands, which I'm going to show you in a minute. Now, remember, so once that's in there, I now have access to all the drawing functionality. So two main things. 
please start by always, always, always defining a canvas. D equals draw. There's that draw that I just promised. Dot drawing. That's the command for establishing a canvas. The first two commands are the size, 200 by 200 pixels. The third command is that the origin should be at the middle. So positive in the horizontal direction, negative in the horizontal direction, positive up, negative down. So that defines a canvas. And then this uh, is at the very end, we'll print whatever was drawn on the canvas into Jupyter Notebook so you can see what you've drawn. The commands in between are commands for drawing. So we have draw a rectangle, draw a line, draw a rectangle, and each of those takes a number of parameters defining what you want to draw in various colors. Okay? I put here the uncommented code, which is not as good as the commented code, just for condensed purposes. You may notice, by the way, that my roof is now blue instead of in the original video green. That's just because I have a green screen back here, and anything that's green keeps it disappearing, so I'm going to head and uh, changing a few of the colors and a few of the things so that we don't clash with uh, the green screen that, you're, um, that we're, is right behind me here. Okay, so that was a quick review of what we talked about in the first lecture. And we're going to talk about some more Python constructs in a, in a little bit. But let me mention a few things because this always sort of comes up, is this difference between style and substance. So you will notice that there are certain things that really matter. Uh, so, for example, uh, when you define a function, there must always be an open, close, and a, open and close parenthesis and a colon. The body of a function must always be indented. Uh, when you use a print statement, there must always be an open and a close paren and then, and then quotes around it. But then other things don't really matter as much. So, for example, all four of these statements are perfectly valid, and they will all do the same thing. They will simply print threatened vengeance onto the output. But there are, they have a different style. So here I'm going to separate again style from substance. So what are the difference? So here you can see I put spaces between the quotes and the parentheses. Here I put space between the print statement and the parentheses. Here I put that, that space is there, but not here. And here I put no spaces. So what's the difference here? Well, nothing really other than style and preference. So my preference is this thing right here. I like having a little bit of space around the parameters that are being passed to the, per to the function because it, I feel like I can read it better. I think you're a monster if you do this. I think having a space between the command and the parentheses is just hideous. It's aesthetically unpleasing to me. I don't know why people do it. Other people think I'm an idiot for that. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer, um, but there's a style. And I'm simply mentioning this because you will have your own style, your own aesthetic, in the same way that we have a style when we write, how we format things, the font we prefer, um, how the order of the words we use. It's a similar type of thing here. And what I suggest is you adopt a style. Um, it doesn't have to be my style. I think that's a good one, by the way. But you can have your own style. But be consistent. It actually makes the code more readable when you have a consistent style throughout your code. So decide what you like. Decide what is readable. Although the functionality is exactly the same, the fact that it's a different readability, do not underestimate the power of that. Code is written for two people, for two things. You, the human, and other programmers, and, of course, the computer to run it. And you can't underestimate the power of the importance of me and you being able to read code. And so the style actually does matter because we are constantly, constantly going back to code uh, and looking at it over and over and over again. Okay, so just a little bit of note on style. So now let's introduce the notion of a variable. So this little bit of code is very similar to what you've already seen before. I'm importing from draw SV as draw, so I'm now draw is going to be uh, my command. I'm going to define a canvas again, 200 by 200 pixels with the origin at the center. So the origin is at the center of this little white square that you see here. And then I'm going to append a series of rectangles. And you can see that the coordinates are just these random four coordinates. Again, remember, it's the bottom left corner of the, the rectangle and then the width and the height. And I filled all the colors with red and I have a stroke of black. So there's a little black line around each red box. So I've drawn five rectangles. Notice, by the way, that order matters. Notice that the squares over here overlay each other. So it's the same way that if you were physically putting down pieces of paper on a canvas, the first one is going to be occluded by the second one, which is going to be occluded by the third one, and so on and so forth. And then at the very end, of course, I just have a D that prints everything out. Okay. So everything we've already seen before. Now notice here that all of the squares in this drawing right here have the same dimensions. They are all 50 by 50 pixels. That's what I picked. That's what I chose. Okay. 
Now, one of the things you have to understand when you, co when you code is that code is not static. Um, when you write code, you will invariably come back to it and have to adapt it and modify or reuse a bit of code. And so reusability of code is incredibly important. And anytime you do something like this where you hardwire numbers in to not just one place but two but three but four and five places, when you want to make a change to this code, it's tedious. You've got to go in and make all these changes. And okay, you can say, well, it's only five lines of code. How bad is it? But what happens when you've got 100 lines of code? And now you've got to go find, and it's not all contiguous. You've got to go find all the places where you hardwired this number 50. And so that's a generally considered a bad idea to hardwire numbers. First of all, because as you're writing code, you're going to make changes. And even later on, you're going to be make changes. And we want to be adaptable. So for example, if I change the canvas size, because I have a bigger monitor, I want to reserve the right to make those bigger. And now I'm going to have to go in line by line and find all the other places where that scale was specified and make changes. Not a great way to do things. And so we, of course, introduce the notion of variables. R equals 50, which, by the way, doesn't look that different than the line above it. D equals draw dot drawing hands back from this module, uh, draw SVG module, a canvas. Now, we don't really know what that is because it's abstracted out for us, but it's, it's a thing. It's actually what we are appending drawing to and then eventually outputting. Very similarly, I'm going to define a variable r to be 50, and then I'm going to use that variable over and over and over again. In what way? So this basically says that the letter r, the variable, is synonymous with the number 50. And so now, notice in my draw rectangle, instead of saying 50, 50, 50, 50, I say R, 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 R. Why is this an improvement? Well, what do we do now if I want to change the size of the rectangles? One line of code right here. And by the way, here's a nice little comment that tells me what I'm doing over here. Now, notice here that this, is, this makes it look like it's an equality. Right? When we see the equal sign, we think equals. So get in the habit, at least in the early days, when you see that equal sign, do not say equals in your head, say assignment. What you are doing is you are assigning the value 50, whatever's on the right-hand side of that assignment operator, to the variable r, whatever is on the left-hand side of that uh, assignment operator. Okay, so r is being assigned the value of 50, not R is 50. R equals 50. Okay, it's a subtle but important difference to keep in your head what that equal operator means. And now notice, for example, if I wanted to make the, 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 the square smaller, I simply say R equals 25. One line of code, done. It propagates all the way down because each line of code here is using that variable. Okay? Good. So a couple of things about variables. Variable names matter. Um, so there I used R just as a random variable, but typically you want to use meaningful names in the same way that you want to use meaningful names in your functions. You want them, again, for the human to be able to look at that function and know what it is. So, for example, I may define uh, the, the variable meaning of life to be 42. Now, this is a variable type of an integer, okay? So that is there's no dot anything else. There's no fraction, okay? So now we've seen two types of, of variables. We've seen a string, whatever's in quotes, and we've seen an integer. There's a few more that we'll be talking about in a little bit. So here is an assignment operator. I am assigning to the variable meaning underscore of underscore life the value 42. Okay. Now, I can use that variable. Now, we know that because in the previous example, I used it. I defined r to be something, and then I used it as a parameter to the draw rectangles. So when I define a variable, or I assign a variable to be a value 42, well, I can do things with it. I can pass it to other functions to be used. I can print the variable, for example. So if I say print the meaning of life, it, of course, will output 42. How? Well, this, of course, notice this isn't in quotes. This isn't like saying print threatened vengeance, and then we, of course, just take threatened vengeance and we shove it um, down onto the output. We are printing a variable. No quote. By the way, no parens either. It's not a function call. It's a variable. And so what Python interpreter says is, well, OK, so the human wants to print this thing. Um, it's not a string. It's not a function. It must be a variable. Let's go find out what it is. And it goes, looks up, and says, ah, human defined meaning of life to be 42. Take that value, shove it in there, and then print it right there. Good. 
So the, the, the way you should, so computer memory, of course, is very sophisticated and very complex, and we're not going to be talking about hardware and how this is implemented. But there's a simple picture you can have in your head when you think about variable assignments. So think of computer memory as this box right here. Okay, so it's just a place somewhere in the computer where information is stored. And when you make an assignment, meaning of life equals 42, what happens is inside of this computer memory, Python reaches in and it grabs a little bit of storage and it puts the value, what was on the right-hand side of the assignment operator, inside of that little storage area. It puts the label, the name of the variable, underneath it, and it stores it there. So think of it as a cupboard. I, put, I, I, I print out on, on a sticker, meaning of life, I slap it onto my uh, cupboard, and inside that cupboard is uh, another piece of paper with the number 42 on it. Okay? And so if somebody says, hey, Fareed, what's the meaning of life? I look into my kitchen, I grab the cup, ah, meaning of life is stored in that cabinet. I go in there, I open it up, and I say 42. Okay? So that's how memory is being stored. It's just, it's just a little compartment where information is being stored, both what you want to store and what the label is or the name of the variable. Okay? So a couple of things about variable names now. So as I said earlier, names matter. So you want to try to use meaningful variables so that when you or I or your TAs or the next person to look at your code looks at your code, they will understand what you are doing. Now, again, when I was talking about style and substance, this is also an example of style versus substance. So some people, when they have variable names like this that are words that spell out, they use underscores so that when you see the letters come together, you can read it more readily. Okay? Other people use so-called camel case, meaning, and then the, the next uh, word is capitalized of, the next word is capitalized life. Also makes it more readable. Is one better than the other? No. I have a preference for this one right here. I think it's a little cleaner. It's aesthetically more pleasing. But again, pick a style. Pick something that you're comfortable with, something that you like, something that you find easy to remember, and just stick with it. And that will become your habit and your style. Okay? Don't do things like this. Don't pick variable names that are just some random letter or whatever. That doesn't, it, there's nothing wrong with it from the computer side of things. The computer doesn't care what your label is. I could have said whatever equals 42, print whatever, and everything would have been fine. But when I go to read code, when you go to read code, the variables, the function names, the comments should all be meaningful to us. You are telling a story in your code, and that story should be easy to understand as I read code. Now, there's a few things to also know about variable names. Um, they are case sensitive. So meaning of life with lowercase is not meaning of life with a capital M. You cannot, you cannot start variable names with a number. Python simply won't let you do that. In fact, most programming languages won't. And you cannot have spaces in your variables. Both of these have to do with how code is parsed and then interpreted. And this simply is too difficult for the parsers to deal with. So no spaces, no numbers. Typically, variable names start have single, uh, uh, low, upper and lowercase letters, and then underscores or um, uh, camel case. You can put numbers later on. So if this is you know x32, that works just fine. Okay, so we've now seen two types of variables: strings. Those are things that are inside of quotes. We've seen integers, and integers are just things without decimals. So in Python. Integers are any numbers between minus 2 to the power uh, 31 and 2 to the power 31 minus 1. And the reason for the asymmetry is that 0 is the inside, and so we lose one number either on the positive or negative side. In this case, it's on the positive side. So we can represent numbers as big with integers as big as 2 billion and, and change, okay? Negative 2 billion to positive 2 billion. Obviously, there are numbers bigger than 2 billion. Um, and so there's another variable type in Python called long int, which is anything that is bigger than negative 2 billion or um, smaller than negative 2 billion or larger than 2 billion. Now, what do you need to know about this? Well, in some languages, C, Java, uh, variables are tight, which means when you say the meaning of life is 42, you also have to say this is an integer, this is a long integer. This is a float value, which you're going to see in a little bit, or this is a string, or this is a character, or this is a Boolean. In Python, you don't. You, it's, a, it's an untyped language in the sense that you do not have to de decide this. Python will decide it for you. So I'm only telling you this because behind the scenes, this is something that's going on. But from your perspective, you define a variable, 
Python will figure out if it's an int, a long int, a double, a float, a character, a string, or a boolean, or whatever else it is. So you don't have to worry about it, but you should know that it's there. Okay. Now, I've already mentioned floating point numbers. So in addition to integers, a is equal to 6. By the way, remember again, assignment operator. The variable a, whatever's on the left-hand side of the assignment operator, is being assigned the value 6. In memory is a cabinet, a is the label, 6 is inside. When you go to use a, either in an expression, a passing to a function, or in a print statement, it reaches into memory, grabs that value associated with a, and then uses that value. It's a synonym for that letter, for that variable name. So that's an integer. Of course, this is a floating point or a fraction, 6.02. Again, underneath, behind the scenes, it's being represented differently. From your perspective, you don't really care. You can just use floating point numbers. And then the last thing I'll say about floating point numbers, you can also use scientific notation. So this is probably the scientific notation you're familiar with, 6.02 times 10 to the 23. In Python, the way you represent that is you just say 6.02 E23. So E is synonymous with times 10. So this, of course, is the base, and that is the exponent. So you can also do scientific notation for the really, really big numbers instead of writing all those zeros out. Okay, so that's it for this uh, first part of the lecture. When we pick it up, we're going to talk some more about variables and expressions and then using those variables um, as we write code. So we'll pick it up um, in a little bit. See you soon.